Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Bob. How are you? Fine, how are you? I'm pretty good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. Um, you are Kathleen Ballou. Uh, you teach history at the University of Chicago. Yes. And most relevantly, for our purposes, you've written a book called The White Power, or the subtitle is The White Power Movement in Paramilitary America. It's called Bring the War Home. Uh, I have been listening to it, so I can't really hold a copy of the book up, but I encourage you, if you have a copy handy, to engage in whatever form of self-promotion you feel comfortable with. Here's what the audio version looks like. But what yes. is the, show us what the book looks like. Here is the hardcover. There I think you go. I've also now got it on Kindle, um, so I would love if people pick up a copy. Okay, and it's published by Harvard University Press. Just came out a couple of months ago, getting well-deserved attention. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, before we get started and talk about the argument you make in the book and, uh, and the narrative arc of the book, um, why don't you, just so that we make sure we understand what you mean by white power, the white power movement, uh, maybe we could talk about the most recent prominent uh, person associated with it, I would say, which is Richard Spencer, the person who's getting the most news lately that I can think of who you'd call part of the white power movement, right? Is, is, is that fair? I mean, David Duke every once in a while makes it, you know, yeah, yeah, but he's kind of semi-retired, isn't he, or something? Yeah, Duke has been on the scene for a long time, and he certainly was more active in the years of my study. Um, this is one of the places where I have to be a historian and tell you that all of my argument stops in 1995 with Oklahoma right. City bombing. And the reason for that is that Bring the War Home is based on a very large archival um, and historical study. Mm -hmm. um, those materials are not yet available for the present moment. So it's much more difficult for me to make um, sort of definitive declarations of what is and what isn't part of this in our present moment. But what I can tell you is that in the period of my study, the white power movement was an amalgamation of different kinds of belief systems and ideologies of whiteness, including um, Klansmen, neo-Nazis, militiamen, skinheads, radical tax resistors, uh, white separatists, um, and other people who followed white cosmologies and theologies. Mm -hmm. um, now, you do, there is an epilogue to the book in which you allude to the present moment, and I forget whether you mentioned Trump by name, but the idea is that the rise of, uh, of the kind of, the, the growing prominence of white nationalism uh, during the presidential election <clears throat> would not have surprised us if we had been paying more attention in a certain sense, right? Because one thing you're arguing is there's been more continuity. I mean, there have been bursts of publicity for people who in various senses qualify for the, the term white power in your view, but, but you're arguing that there's been more of a persistent underlying impetus than we appreciate, right? And that that goes up to the present moment. Yes, and I think the archive shows us here that what seems new in our present moment is not new, but is actually the result of decades of organizing and strategizing by the white power movement, which we should note was a social movement that connected people across all kinds of class backgrounds, across all regions of the country. Um, it included men, women, and children, and a whole bunch of different groups. Mm -hmm. um, the, in the epilogue of the book, I talk about how some of this rhetoric has returned to mainstream politics in a way that it simply was not, um, it wasn't a main mode of political discourse when I started the project. And certainly we've seen that in the aftermath of Trump's election and even more so since Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, and I do feel comfortable in some cases talking about um, the more recent period. So Dylan Roof, for instance, is really clearly part of this movement. He left us a manifesto. He, he killed all those people at that church in, was it, what, South Carolina or what? Where was it? Yeah, yeah, in, um, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we have a manifesto that talks about his belief system that's clearly drawn from this movement. He used, um, in framing his attack, he posted pictures to social media of himself wearing not only a Confederate flag patch, which is sort of um, a more contested and wider a symbol with wider meaning, but mm -hmm. he wore a Rhodesian flag patch, um, which refers, of course, to a white minority rural government in, in Southern Africa in what is now Zimbabwe um, and was a, a, like a flagstone issue for white power activists in the 80s, but was never that was never a thing during Dylan Roof's lifetime. So here we see that he's really clearly involved in this older history. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a special case in terms of how much you can draw forward my analysis. Mm -hmm. And so as for Spencer himself, I mean, just kind of 
scanning his beliefs as I understand them, I assume he would he would qualify for your definition. Why do you, do you uh, for as as a part of the white power movement? I mean, he hasn't <clears throat> advocated violence. Well, um, I think. Well, so again, I won't get specifically into. Okay. I haven't studied his writings at the level that uh -huh. I've studied the people that I write about in this book. Okay. Um, but I think that what I can tell you is that this history shows us that there is no white nationalism that is nonviolent. Um, this is one of the reasons I like the terminology white power rather than white nationalism. When we say nationalism, um, what most people think about, and certainly what the general public thinks about, is the category of the nation, right? Mm -hmm. um, we assume that the nation is going to be the United States. But for these activists, the nation is not the United States. The nation is a transnational racial nation that people imagine fulfilling through. I, I've never seen a proposal that didn't involve some violent mechanism, whether it is marching people out of a certain terrain, seizing a homeland and defending it, um, or gradually taking over the world. All of those are real strategies that were brought up by this movement and pursued in real life by people over decades in the time that I write. Right. And I should say, when I say that Richard Spencer has has an advocated violence, uh, an important footnote is that I actually don't know what I'm talking about. I don't I don't know that he's never advocated violence. What I had in mind was that he describes uh, the kind of uh, ethnic cleansing he favors as, quote, peaceful ethnic cleansing. Now, I don't know how you, you know, do that without physical coercion that would seem pretty close to violence. But but that aside, that's his claim, whereas some of the people you write about in the book, they, they, yeah, we're going to blow people up and kill people. I mean, you talk about Timothy McVeigh, as you said, the, the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, so, uh, but in any event, uh, you, you, you certainly are arguing, as you say, that seemingly disparate elements have important unifying themes. So whether it's the group called The Order or Aryan Nations or the old Ku Klux Klan or these various groups are ultimately uh, uh, bound by a kind of common purpose, even if they differ on specific tactics, and even uh, detailed aspirations, right? Right. Well, and that people, real people, are moving through all of these groups over time. So they're not static belief systems. And I think that's one place where scholars and journalists have often failed to describe the movement as it was really happening. Mm -hmm. um, people want to sort people, of course. You know, it's a very human thing to want to make um, a definition for what is a skinhead and it's this column, what is a neo-Nazi and it's this column, but actually people are moving through all of these right. uh, groups over the course of the movement. And one thing that a historical and archival approach lets us do is look not only at rhetoric and symbols, but actually at the lived actions of people over time. Um, and what that reveals is this cohesive movement with very flexible and opportunistic belief systems that was able to mobilize people in this way. Um, now, thinking about peaceful ethnic cleansing um, and also about, quote unquote, I should say, peaceful ethnic cleansing, um, and also about the idea of, um, you know, so there, um, again, what seems new is not new. I mean, the, the idea of someone dressing in a way that is more palatable, um, whether it is polo shirts and khakis or a suit, that's right out of the David Duke playbook. He pioneered that in the 1970s, and that was all about a better educated, more genteel clan. He would say, um, well, people in that moment would say that they were racialists rather than racist or separatists rather than segregationists to sort of get around popular opinion, right? Um, the That, in the period of my study, matched the machinations of a well-organized well and highly armed underground so that the public facing part of that activism was always matched by a concurrent surge in paramilitary activity that had real body count. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I don't have what I would need to know if that's happening now in terms mm -hmm. of um, surveillance documents, newspaper coverage, undercover reporting. Um, a lot of early ethnographies started to reveal this. Um, and then the ephemera of the people themselves. I think that to tell that story, um, you would need to speak many languages and have some uh, familiarity with computer programming that I just don't have. I hope somebody goes and writes that book. Mm -hmm. There's a graduate student out there who speaks German and Russian and is really great at computer coding and wants to look into this. Please write me. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah. So um, sometimes you're you're saying sometimes the there is a paramilitary dimension that's not evident. Uh, and so people don't make the connection between maybe violent aspirations uh, and and white power the way they they might. It can also work the other way in the sense that I, I think, as I recall, you say that Timothy McVeigh, not enough emphasis. You know, he, of course, did the Oklahoma City bombing in 95. Not an, I think you say that not enough emphasis was put on the the white power aspect of his political identity and 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 there but there was as i recall there was a lot of emphasis on the militia part and yeah. and 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 there was but i but i think i agree with you because just as i dimly recall these militias i mean first of all it was like suddenly everyone was talking about these militias because we discovered that he had been circulating through this subculture of militias right. and we didn't know who they were but the reporting did not emphasize, I don't know whether rightly or wrongly, I don't think it emphasized, uh, uh, you know, what segregationist or white power uh, associations with the militia. I, I recall them emphasizing that the militia were, they were certainly, there was an anti-government vibe, obviously, the federal office building wasn't randomly selected by McVeigh, but also the survivalist aspect. These were survivalists, right? And that got a whole lot of play. The racial thing, I don't think, did get a lot of play. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective because the the extent to which their the survivalism of this movement is about their racism is actually really important. Hmm. Um, a lot of the people that I write about believed that the end was at hand, but for them, the apocalypse was equal parts about um, the fear of racial annihilation and the fear of the end of the world. Those things are together in this movement. Mm -hmm. um, again, with the militia movement, I think that's a case where people are wanting to make some clear divisions between two moments. Um, and this appeared even in um, very good journalistic coverage at the time um, that there was a difference between the paramilitary movements that I look at in the 1980s and the militias of the early 90s. Um, and sometimes that slippage is even bigger and people talk about the militias as rising up in 1995, right, with mm -hmm. the Oklahoma City bombing itself. But actually the FBI documents show that the militias were active in the Northwest at least as early as 1989. Um, Generally, the FBI doesn't notice right when something starts. So I would assume that it's a little earlier than that. Um, and in that time, they documented um, people going to white power meetings at Aryan Nations, talking about militias and then showing up at the militia the next year, mm -hmm. right? So there's a really clear outgrowth. I don't think it's so simple as simply saying um, that the militias are the white power movement. Um, I think the militia movement was larger. I think it was slightly more um, heterogeneous in the sense that not all of it was overtly racialized in the same way. But I do think a lot of people who were in the white power movement were also in the militia mm -hmm. movement. So thinking about those things as two broken pieces, um, I think it's a historical mistake. Okay. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes as a historian, you can get caught up in this um, this sense of arguing over tiny things. Um, that don't seem to be very important to other people. Um, and, and we will go back and forth about like how to, you know, how to periodize something. When does something really start and end? This is a debate we have all the time about all kinds of different historical events. But in this case, how you periodize white power is really, really important because if you do it wrong, it misses things and obscures things that are absolutely vital to our public discourse. For instance, People often talk about the white power movement going online in 1995 after the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, and, you know, that's when the first major Internet website went up, Stormfront. Um, but white power activists were using computer and message boards as early as 1983, 84. Mm -hmm. um, they were buying computers with stolen money and distributing them to groups across the country. Basically, the white power movement was pioneering social network activism before any of us had ever even, you know, dreamed of Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you give them another 10 years of thinking about and using and refining these methods, you can see how this becomes not just like an accidental, um, I don't know, not to go too far into the present. It's not like an accidental 4chan Reddit moment. It's a thing that's been building for decades by people who know how to do it. Um, and I think that really changes how we see the gravity of this kind of activism. Okay. So let's... Um... 
start at kind of the beginning of your narrative, and 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 we should maybe at this point be a little more uh, explicit about the the part of your title that reflects a big part of your thesis. So bring bring the war home. You're arguing that there's a closer connection than people realize between the white power movement and American military involvement, uh, including the Vietnam War, also the Persian Gulf War. Um, McVeigh had been in the Persian Gulf War, right? Timothy McVeigh had been in the Persian Gulf War. And, and it has more than one dimension. It isn't just that people who served in these wars come back uh, with, with guns. There's a, lot, there's a lot of, or knowing how to use guns, uh, there's a lot to it. So why don't we start with Vietnam, which, which I gather is not just where you happen to pick up the story, but you think is, is really an important threshold in the development of the movement. Obviously, the KKK had gone way back. Uh, but, but Vietnam, and particularly, uh, you focus on a guy named Louis Beam, who I think was one of the pioneers of this, uh, kind of pre World Wide Web, uh, use yeah. of, of networking technology you're talking about. Very important figure. It's B E A M, I think, right? Louis Beam. Yeah. So why don't you, why don't you pick up the story with, with Vietnam? Sure. Um, so, well, let me just lay out one thing about the argument of the book, and then I'll go into the specific story. Okay. Um, the argument that I'm making about the relationship between war and violence is a longer thing. It's not just about the Vietnam War. It's about every war in American, in, in recent American history. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see is that after warfare, there is a spike in violence that stretches across not only returning veterans, but all sectors of society. So men and women, veterans and civilians, everybody, there's a spike in general violence. There's some kind of overflow or ricochet of violence of warfare that impacts the home front. Now, this, um, this happens like after the wars end generally? After the end. There's, of the there's just an echo of violence on the, on the domestic front. Yes. Is it of a particular character? Does it include like uh, spousal abuse and crime, uh, you know, robbing Stores and killing, it, it, it's kind of... I have to look at what's included in that statistic. Um, I know it includes political violence. I think it also includes general crime. Um, mm -hmm. I would have to go and look. That's okay. in work. If people would like the citation, I'm happy to send it. You can post it. Okay. Um, the, so, so, so it's not just that veterans come home and repeat something. It's not just as simple as Rambo, right? Like, it's not just a person that can't be turned away from doing violent activism. Um, I think for this movement, the Vietnam War allowed um, the creation of a narrative about government betrayal, violence, um, meaning, the nearness of apocalypse, all of these things together in one belief system that allowed people to band together across different factions. And, and by um, government betrayal, you mean like the government wouldn't let them fight the war and win it? And then yeah. they come home and they're not appreciated and people spit on them and all that whole set of like, we exactly. weren't allowed to be true soldiers and appreciated as such. Exactly. And now that narrative is not just, as you know, not just in the white power movement by any stretch. That is the rising narrative of the Vietnam War that historians have argued has really taken hold by the early 1980s that um, it's, it's sort of the trope of Vietnam that we know from movies and memoirs and, and everything else about the war in our culture now. Um, so if you take, so I think what happens with Lewis Beam is that he was able to really use that story in a very compelling way to bring together people that couldn't get in the same room before. Um, so Beam he was, was, a, he was a decorated veteran of Vietnam, right? He had yeah. really been a re, uh, really in the action. Yeah. yeah. Beam had served in Germany and then had served two tours in Vietnam as a gunner on a Huey helicopter. And he wrote, um, a whole bunch of essays about his time there. Um, at multiple points in his life. He was a prolific writer, a prolific public speaker. Um, the archive on him is huge, which means that there's a lot of real information in addition to what he has said about himself, which are two different sort of data points. Um, the title of my book comes from an essay of his that was published in a collection called Essays of a Klansman, which was printed at the Aryan Nations Compound in Idaho in 1983 and then reissued in 1989. Um, and in that essay, what Beam is asking is for people to bring, literally to bring it on home, bring home the war. Um, he says something like, let those of us, I'm not going to be able to do this from memory, I don't think, but it's something like, um, let those of us who fought, you know, show them, let, or, or let the fallen, um, 
let the, let the people on the home front experience what the fallen have experienced basically. Mm. So the idea is like all of the people who he sees as betrayers, which for him includes, I mean, everyone from the government to the media, to movie stars, to um, journalists and professors, to communists everywhere. Let all of these people who don't understand this traumatic event experience it for themselves by our bringing the war home to them. Now, that idea of bring the war home um, is also not unique to the white power movement. We see similar things um, in rhetoric on the left, um, in paramilitary groups on the left, um, in art, um, in Vietnam veterans against the war. There's a whole lot of talk about this gulf um, at this historical moment between the experience of combat and the experience of the home front. Um, and even though, you know, even though it's, it's a war that is on television and in people's living rooms for the first time, um, it's also a war that is very far away. It's not fought as a shared civil project. It has sort of dubious morality. Um, it has sort of um, an increasingly complicated um, process of return, as you've talked about. And there's a bunch of other things about it that are alienating from the structure mm -hmm. of combat all the way on through to how veterans come back. Yeah. Now, so you can see why they're alienated from the government. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily uh, validating the grievance, but you see where the grievance comes from. Sure. It, it might be less obvious why it would have this racist dimension. Sometimes, I mean, I mean, of course, the troops were integrated in Vietnam, but sometimes combat has a unifying effect on yeah. multi-ethnic uh, co combatants. Sure, it does, and it's also an incubator for all kinds of leftist social movements and other kinds of politics. I mean, um. I think that, well, and this is what's really compelling about Lewis Beam as a writer. And um, when, you know, when you teach this to undergraduates, this is the first thing that they notice is that he's making a case for sort of the wrongness of war. War is a moral injury, both to the fabric of society and to himself and to his fellow soldiers. Um, at one point, he thinks about like, is the blood from this body bag a white man or a black man or a dead man? Like war can even... Er it's a body bag in his helicopter, right? Yeah, he's, and he's hauling. And he's hauling bodies, which is a very, very um, high exposure to all kinds of, you know, fatigue and combat trauma and other concerns mm -hmm. like that. But he... The thing is that he lays out that narrative, which we're all very familiar with, and then in the last few paragraphs pivots around to calling for um, ensuring the future of white children and worrying about the annihilation of the race and the conspiracy um, of internationalist forces that's trying to control the country and how things are lost and things like this. So he's both utilizing the Vietnam War narrative and sort of providing this um, a way to attach that to reactions to the social movements that had really reshaped the country in the prior years. Mm -hmm. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I gather that often in Vietnam, racial relations among American soldiers were fraught. Not always, but there was tension. I mean, this was the late 60s. Right. You had, you know, a lot of ferment in the black community in the United States. You had the Black Panthers, the Black Power Movement, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, so there was some, uh, some, some absence of harmony often, I gather. Yeah, I mean, everything from, well, so we can think of it as this is, Vietnam was the first real test of the integrated army, and certainly they hadn't worked it all out yet. Um, the, um, I mean, the sources document everything from people um, hanging Confederate flags in their hooch to race riots on mm. posts and bases in the United States and at base camps in Vietnam. Um, and then on top of all of that, there's also racial strife between, of course, the, the soldiers and the Vietnamese combatants and Vietnamese citizens that they're there purportedly to protect, but actually often had a very violent interaction with um, mm -hmm. in ways that have been documented by other scholars. Yeah. And in fact, um, I mean, the, the movement, the white power movement had a very pronounced like anti-communist uh, dimension of its ideology. Right. And, and I guess I'm not, uh, Totally. I mean, some of that must have preceded Vietnam. I mean, there is a connection with like the John Birch Society. There is a little sure. bit of a lineage there, right? Going back before Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But but I gather that the war somehow, I mean, even though in some ways they weren't happy with about being thrown into a war against communists, the enmity with communists really stuck in a big way, yeah. right? Well, I think two things. Yes, that's a continuation of Vietnam War rhetoric that was very useful for the movement, but it's also an example of how um, how the white power movement was still drawing on strategy from the Ku Klux Klan, 
um, especially earlier in the 20th century. So if you look at the second era of the Klan, which is the, the largest Klan membership moment in the 1920s, we're talking about um, around 4 million people. Um, and that's, the, you know, that's the Klan that was very much part of sort of like a, a public club culture and did a lot of um, parading in public, women's and children's auxiliary activities. Um, there are famous pictures of them marching on the mall in Washington, D.C. with robes and hoods, but no mask. So it's a much more public facing clan. Mm -hmm. That clan is a really good example of um, how history can show us what white power was doing with, by using communism. Mm -hmm. um, so the twenties clan we think of was anti-black, right? Classically anti-black in the South and it was anti-black everywhere, but on the U S Mexico border, it was anti-Mexican in the Pacific Northwest where it was, where there was a lot of union activity. It was anti-labor. Um, in the Northeast, where there was a lot of immigrants, it was anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic, and also anti-Catholic um, in Indiana because of Notre Dame, and there's a bunch of um, interactions there. So the, the, the Klan is, was ready to be, you know, it, it's classically anti-Black and anti-Semitic, but it was also prepared to be anti-Communist when that was a more um, fruitful recruitment pitch, and also a, a, there was less public opposition to anti-communist violence than anti-racial, or excuse me, than racist violence. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that the Klan had been, I guess, anti-Mexican on, on the border, if I got that right. One of the uh, early post-Vietnam manifestations of the white power movement involved immigrants, and in fact, immigrants from Vietnam, and this really struck me because of the current context where mm -hmm. a certain amount of the, uh, the, I think, you know, the activity of people you'd, you'd you'd call part of the white power movement, at least loosely, um, involves immigrants. And, yeah. and uh, there, there was a big, uh, that was a big deal. It was these Vietnamese fishermen, right? Right. So what happened is, um, the so Lewis Beam, after he returned, purchased land to create a paramilitary training camp near um, Anahuac, Texas. Um, he actually used the Texas Veterans Land Grant to make that purchase. So he was using a veteran's benefit to create a paramilitary training apparatus to bring the war home, quite literally. Um, and what happened is in a nearby series of fishing communities, there was this large influx of Vietnamese refugee families um, who had self-located to the area because they knew the climate, they knew how to do crab and shrimp fishing. Um, they pooled their resources, they bought boats, um, often at dramatically inflated prices, and then um, they began fishing. And these refugees um, often lived with a communal lifestyle, um, eating only what they caught in the bay, living many people to one um, trailer, and were able to sort of like outfish the local fishermen um, with their lifestyle in many ways. Um, so, so there was that same the kind of competition you see, a perceived competition for jobs, basically. Yeah, I mean, this was a legit competition for jobs yeah. in that um, in order for the white fishermen in this community to compete, they would have really had to take a huge lifestyle cut. Um, and there were also problems with overfishing as a result of the, the population resettlement. But yes, we saw um, in this incident, there was a huge um, focus on this by a clan and sort of um, early white power groups. Um, the Klan came in and trained the white fishermen who were upset in the paramilitary camp and got them rallying and parading and harassing the Vietnamese refugees. And what ended up happening is that the refugees came together with the Southern Poverty Law Center, filed a civil suit, um, and got a stop granted to parading in public with firearms, which is, was against the law at Texas at the time, and I believe still is, although I see pictures that seem to indicate otherwise. Um, there, um, but, but they got to stop. They, they, they stopped the Klan harassment and um, Louis Beam even relocated to Idaho for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that incident is a really interesting one. It, it's sort of a, a classic, um, well, a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric from earlier in the 20th century showed up in the, um, the white power publications about this series of events. So it's a moment where we see a lot of sort of historical threads coming together. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you just mentioned these uh, paramilitary camps. Yeah. One thing that surprised me uh, in listening to the book was um, 
how many different such camps there have been in the United States. I mean, as I said, this kind of hit my radar screen right after the McVeigh bombing when you started hearing about these militias. And even then, they sounded like sometimes they were kind of itinerant and there wasn't necessarily a single camp. It was just guys that get, find a place to get together on the weekend. But I, I, I gather there were what you could call paramilitary camps at various places in the United States, certainly in the South. Yeah. Uh, later in, in, you know, in the West and the Northwest, yeah. right? Yeah, and I suspect that there was one in Pennsylvania, although I haven't been able to figure that. Lead. I haven't run that lead all the way down. The, um, yeah, they were across the country. Um, people traveled to these camps from all over. People traveled between the camps. Um, and at the camps, they these were, I mean... They, some of them were, were weekend in the sense that they had periods of activity and inactivity, but they were by no means sort of like hobby camps. Um, they were outfitted with very sophisticated weapons and material. Um, people trained in everything from, um, you know, nuclear medicine, not nuclear medicine, but um, nuclear attack um, response first aid and things like this to urban warfare and sniper shooting and um things like that. They, they, they had things like um, anti-tank weapons and they made their own Claymore mines. These are not low tech things. Yeah. It's not, well, let me put it this way. It's not just a bunch of people getting together to do something for fun on the weekend. It's, it's right. a serious training apparatus. And some of them had the explicit plan of like what, like overthrowing the government or throwing the government into chaos or. Well, so, and this is the trickiest, this might be the trickiest thing to understand about this whole movement is how could a small fringe group of people with, you know, something like 25,000 hardcore activists only, how could they think that they could win against the United States, which is this huge militarized super state in the late 20th century? How could they possibly pull that off? And I think there we have to turn again, well, to a different kind of archive. There's this book, The Turner Diaries, which is mm -hmm. a... Um, it's, it's sort of set up as a dystopian fiction piece um, about a white revolution that successfully overthrows the government and then creates first a white nation and then a white world. Um, but it really became the playbook of this movement. Hundreds of thousands of copies circulated through the movement. They turned up everywhere. I mean, Timothy they I think, had one um, either in his truck, trunk or in his, on his person at the time of the bombing. Um, I should check that. But he, he had it. He, he read it and he referenced it. Um, they kept a stack of 20 of them at the bunkhouse for the order, which was a paramilitary terrorist group in the Northwest. Um, they distributed them for free at a Klan um, and a white power training paramilitary camp in North Carolina. This book was every place. And what it shows is that acts like the Oklahoma City bombing were never meant to be the end point of what they were doing. What it was supposed to do was awaken the people. Mm -hmm. These acts were supposed to work like guerrilla warfare. They were supposed to wake people up to the corruption of what they thought of as the system, um, which was for this movement, um, either the uh, Zionist occupational government, which was thought of as a um, conspiracy of Jewish and internationalist forces. So when you see the letter Zog on like yeah. right wing websites, that's yeah. what that refers to. That's what that is. Um, it, the idea is that there are secretly Jews and other people in control of the U.S. government, the banks, the United Nations, et cetera, and that all of that then controls the media and other institutions. Of and that goes back pretty far. I mean, yeah. certainly the, the anti-Semitism goes back to the original Klan. Yeah. I mean, this is like, yeah, you would trace that back to Protocols of the Elders of Zion and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, Zog in the movement eventually sort of loses popularity and gets replaced with their idea of the new world order, yeah. um, which is not the same new world order that you hear in say um, George Bush speeches. Although did, did they get it from him? I, so George W. Bush, the original, the, the first president Bush gave this speech where he talked about a new world order. And it was yeah. after that, that I remember it showing up, in right-wing sites as this threat. It was like, this was part of like, the New World Order was the, the, the thing that the black helicopters were gonna, you know, it was right. part of the menacing yeah. United Nations that was gonna send the black helicopters into your backyard. And by the right. way, I mean, consistent with your thesis about how kind of in a way diffuse and hard to pin down this is, that kind of rhetoric you saw in just uh, like on Pat Robertson's channel, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't mean the Zog part, but the New World Order part. 
He's like, had a book called The New World Order. Yeah, okay, there you go. So just in like right-wing Christian circles not thought of, and, right. and maybe they didn't think of themselves as part of the white power movement, but they were, um, you know, they were promulgating some of the memes that were also being embraced. Yeah, memes is actually a really good way to think about this because bits of this ideology were very portable and very attractive. And I think that part of the way that white power worked was to bring people in through a common idea that they could get behind, like the Vietnam War story or the New World Order um, or the apocalypse, actually, for evangelicals also. Right. And use that as a recruitment tactic to bring people farther into the movement. So if you think about, um, you know, I mean, as I said, this is a fringe movement. So at, at its largest point, we're talking about perhaps 5 million in the militia movement, including members and sympathizers. That is the highest estimate I've ever seen. And I think that that's probably, you know, that, as I said, that would not, inc that would include a lot of people who are not white power activists. And I think it's probably a little high. Um, but I do think that we can trace sort of concentric circles of movement activity. So in the eighties, for instance, we're talking about 25,000 hardcore activists. Those are people who live and breathe the movement, people who marry other people in the movement, um, you know, their childcare and their schools are within the movement, um, their jobs are arranged by people in the movement often, um, and all their friends are, you know, full-time they're in this movement. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, there is like 125 to 150,000 people who aren't quite so hardcore as that, but will buy the literature, go to a rally, go to public events, go to a cross burning, things like that. Outside of that, there's another 450,000 people who would not themselves buy the literature, but who would read the literature. And you can imagine that this goes on and on and includes sort of this diffusion of belief. Yeah, so, and it includes, I mean, somewhere on the periphery, it includes things that I remember, like Soldier of Fortune magazine, which you talk about, which I had thought of as just this kind of like hyper macho, like these guys who imagine being mercenaries, they have guns, they like guns, but it, yeah. it, it had a, 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 a sometimes close to explicit political dimension, right? Absolutely. Well, so and one of the interesting things is that similarly, um, I mean, Soldier of Fortune is not a white power publication and was not at the time of my, my study, but it did sort of enable white power activity. So, I mean, the camo fatigues worn by the order were purchased at a Soldier of Fortune convention. Um, Timothy McVeigh and Soldier of Fortune went to the same gun shows, right? So there is sort of like a shared paramilitary circuitry mm -hmm. of um, connection. Um, but it's also like, you know, Soldier of Fortune referred to a whole lot of armchair warriors on the outside of the circle. And then to some people who might one day go to a paramilitary training camp for fun. And then in the center, a whole bunch of, well, not a whole bunch, but a smaller group of survivalists actual mercenaries, white power readership, etc. So I think the way that these things, um, you know, can diffuse is part of how you find those points of connection with the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about sort of the idea of the New World Order, well, first of all, just that I think Zog slides pretty easily into the New World Order. I think it, um, the, that the, those two terms do the same thing within the movement rhetoric. Um, so New World Order was like, code for Jewish conspiracy to run the world, basically? Yeah. Or internationalist conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, well, not the way George Bush, that's not what George Bush meant, but the way... No, 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 within this movement. It's, yeah. But it's the idea, you know, it's the idea that there is a malevolent conspiracy that runs the world and has to be resisted through guerrilla warfare and revolution, is, is the distillation at the center of that concentric circle. The, um... Well, the other thing is that, um... I think it's really important to think about the meaning of the end of the world within that narrative. Um, that's where Pat Robertson and evangelical belief can come into the same, um, what's the best way to think about this? It's that, that's where those belief systems touch. Um, except that, evangelicals um, who are also increasingly apocalyptic in the 1980s and who have rising numbers um, quite dramatically across the 80s have a doctrine of rapture, which is the idea that there's going to be this moment where they will be peacefully transported out of the world and up to heaven before the time of tribulations, which is before the return of Christ. Um, the people that I write about who believed in a Christian end of days are Christian identity or two seed proponents. Mm -hmm. And 
that sect did not have an idea of rapture. They believed that there would be that they would be on earth during the period of tribulation. They had to outlast the tribulations before mm, mm. Christ could return. And a lot of them also believed that they were supposed to be the army of God who cleared the world of the unfaithful before Christ could come back. Um, and in Christian identity theology, the unfaithful are, um, well, and the non-human is everybody non-white, um, including people of color and Jews who are talked about as being descended from animals or from Satan, depending on the doctrine. Um, and then all of the traitors, right? There's a lot of traitors in this ideology. All of those people they thought would need to be cleared from the earth before, you know, the, before Christ could return. That is a powerful, powerful thing. They, so some people responded to that just by becoming survivalists, stockpiling food, learning how to make soap, um, um, you know, stockpiling weapons. Um, but other people really thought that they would be the soldiers. Um, and, and for that belief, you know, you had to really, I mean, I, I, it, I, I just think it's a very powerful ideology. Mm -hmm. And I gather that early in the earlier phase, like right after Vietnam, as compared to, say, now in the last 10 years, a lot of the people in the white power movement did identify strongly as Christian. I mean, now you think of like, well, skinheads, neo-Nazis. I have no idea if Richard Spencer's a Christian. Maybe he is and I should know that. But but I don't we don't think today of uh, Christianity, of Christian identity as being as central to the movement as it was right after Vietnam. Like Louis Beam considered himself a very uh, uh, good Christian, right? Yeah, well, Beam was very devout. I think, um, well, that's one of the things that I, I'm not sure we know the answer to uh -huh. yet because I think a lot of um, kind of the level, I think a lot of the level of the importance of religion within a social movement is actually found in the archive of women's action. Um, mm -hmm. because women tend to be the people who are, um, in, often are brokering social relationships, paving over differences, but also are necessary for the kinds of relationships that can be, um, framed through religion. So in my archive, there's actually a huge, um, a trove of people who married within the movement, took care of each other's children within the movement. It's everything from rides to the airport to marriage counseling. And a lot of that was through Christian Identity Church. Um, so that's one of the places where I think history can show us what might be happening. But I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't really be able to speculate on relative importance of faith within the movement without an archive. Okay. So um, then during the 80s, I mean, there's a number of incidents that like I had kind of half forgotten but uh, now you know when you mention them in the book they spring to mind like the uh, murder of Alan Berg the disc jockey mm -hmm. in Denver who had confronted some of these people on the radio um and I don't and then a couple of other things and then there's Timothy McVeigh the big thing yeah. and uh as you note it's the biggest uh until 9-11 it was the biggest thing since Pearl Harbor in terms of number of uh, Americans in America killed by a violent attack, right? Yeah, it's the largest deliberate mass casualty um, between Pearl Harbor and 9-11. I think the reason that we've forgotten about a lot of these things or the reason that they haven't, I mean, forgotten is not the right word exactly, because as you say, you remember them when they happened, right? But we didn't have the narrative frame to put mm -hmm. them together and make sense of what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that frame is really important for a lot of different reasons. Um, but mostly because what it shows us is how much this was a social movement, which means that when we talk about these events and understand acts of violence, we're not talking about a lone wolf or a single action or, um, you know, one shooting, the assassination of one person, which is how that event is uh, mm -hmm. usually narrated. It's part of this large social movement that has an ideology behind it and that's connected to many other acts of violence. Um, it's interesting because all of the events I write about in this book were reported at the time of their occurrence. Um, I mean, there was footage of the paramilitary camps in Galveston on morning news shows. Um, they were covered in the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, and local papers. There were a bunch of really great um, kind of uh, local reporters who got in depth into one part of this. So there's, there was a, a record when it happened. The Greensboro shooting was even a Saturday Night Live sketch. 
But somehow in the interim, we've ended up... Now, with remind us, the Greensboro shooting is... Yeah. Um, that was the shooting in 1979 of uh, five leftist demonstrators by a neo-Nazi and Klan gunman. Okay. Um, and that one was captured on, on two different news cameras, and everyone was still acquitted in state um, and federal trials, and only a partial justice was rendered in the civil trial. But I think, I think what happened is that um, there was a large seditious conspiracy trial in 1987-88 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, that became deeply embarrassing for the government because all of the white power activists tried were acquitted mm -hmm. um, despite demonstrable seditious conspiracy that they talked about and wrote about and were carrying out. Including Lewis Beam, right? Including Beam, yeah. The, that trial was uh, of dubious um, partiality, shall we say. So things happened like two defendants had romantic relationships with jurors um, uh, that's one of the warning signs. If you're if you if you're the uh, you know the, the partiality watchdog, I'd say yeah. that should get the meter yeah. going a little. Yeah. Another, another juror besides those ones said that race mixing. They thought race mixing was uh, prohibited prohibited by the Bible. Tons of evidence was excluded, including evidence that showed that Beam was tied to the order. Um, so it was a, it was a problem trial. That trial afterwards, um, my, my colleague Leonard Zeskin found that an FBI document had actually set out the policy of, we're not going to try this movement anymore. We're going to go for individuals. We're not going to mm -hmm. try to do this as a movement because it, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that the sedition trial plus, you know, the, the huge public relations disasters that were also great tragedies at Ruby Ridge and Waco um, meant that by the time we got to the Oklahoma City bombing, there wasn't even an investigation of mm -hmm. of whether there was a movement behind him. And, and for people who don't remember quickly, I mean, sure. uh, the Waco was this, uh, well, first of all, Ruby Ridge was a, a tax evader who had an ideological connection, I would say, with the white power movement, right? The well, FBI wound up killing his wife, not him, not intentionally, but, but, but yeah. he was holed up in a cabin and and uh, they killed his wife, and and that that became a big cause uh, among white power movement. He had, well, he certainly had a strong anti-government stance, right? Uh, well, he was, I mean, he was. I think he was in the movement. I, he was he in the was movement. Aryan okay. Several times he were in Aryan Nations. Um, I think either in Aryan Nations or a Zog belt buckle. Mm -hmm. And he he ran for office in Boundary County, Idaho, on the platform of enforcing only the laws that people wanted enforced, mm -hmm. which is a strategy from Posse Comitatus. Which okay. Is not Whereas Waco, that wasn't so much. The people holed up in no. Waco weren't so much connected with the movement. They were just no. religious zealots. But that became a big cause because it was seen as an abuse of uh, government yeah. authority. Yeah, in both cases. I, well, so I should also say, uh, Randy Weaver, it wasn't tax evasion. It was entrapment for, well, not entrapment, but he, they were trying to turn him into an ATF informant by getting him to sell a shotgun that was a quarter of an inch too short. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, they had him on, a, on, an, on an obscure weapons charge and wanted to use that to turn him into a... Well, then he refused to come to his court date. Okay, I thought there wasn't there a tax issue. It doesn't really matter, but I thought no. there was some there no, was no tax thing. A, that was a, I think that was a one of the um, one of the Montana ones later. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, so anyway, these things became. Uh, uh, I interrupted you, but I just wanted to establish no. for people who sure. might not know what what Ruby Ridge and Waco meant. But those became big causes. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, those events are important too because if you think about multiple kinds of paramilitarism in American society. Those events are where we see the rising arc of white power activism on the one hand and the rising arc of paramilitary policing on the other hand kind of collide with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's Waco and Ruby Ridge were not the first time that police had used militarized weapons and tactics on American citizens, but they were notable um, in that they were used on white American citizens and on the evening news. Mm -hmm. um, particularly Waco was covered for, I think, 51 days. Um, and the end of that siege was a, it was, you know, like the compound caught on fire, children died. It was a huge, um, uh, it was, it was an enormous tragedy and a huge PR crisis. Okay. So, um, these things were kind of helping to sustain maybe the fervor of the movement to some extent, yeah. but, um, but then in, in 95, uh, the, the, uh, 
the, the bombing, the McVeigh bombing happens. And here you have, we have another kind of connection to the military. He was a veteran. Uh, yeah. Among his supposed, uh, this was not a stated grievance, but he had tried to, he had done, I think, fine as a soldier in the Persian Gulf War, but he had tried to get into special forces and he had washed out. He hadn't, yeah. he hadn't made it. Um, but anyway, he's another case where you see a, a relevant connection between war and white power. I mean, he had some of the ideology going into the war, but he was yeah. he was kind of more militant in the uh, aftermath. Yeah, and there's there is a there's sort of an archival trace of McVeigh becoming more and more involved in this movement. Um, he had ties with. Um, different sort of high profile leaders of both white power and militia groups. Um, he had um, traveled to Elohim City, which was a white power compound that had also sheltered um, members of the order who were on the run. Um, he had received Klan newspapers and written to his sister about different white power ideas. Um, he carried and distributed the Turner Diaries. Um, and I think most persuasively is sort of the information about the target. Um, so the Murrah building in, in Oklahoma City had been in the, in sort of in the crosshairs of this movement since 1983, um, partly because um, the building's design made it easy to attack, they thought, but partly because the way that this movement worked was to, well, I like what you said earlier about memes. There was sort of a meme about the, the Murrah building that went mm. from group to group. So when McVeigh stayed with Terry and James Nichols, um, who were in the Michigan militia. And, and he had known Terry in the Army, right? That's right. James could draw the Murrah building. I believe James. One of the Nichols brothers could draw the Murrah building by memory, could diagram it by memory, freehand on a piece of paper. They had been thinking so much about this building. Um, another group called the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, which was a paramilitary white power compound in Arkansas, Missouri, um, had attempted to blow it up with a um, shoulder-mounted missile um, in 1983, um, and it hadn't worked for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but but they had, there had been attempts on this building before. And for the bombing date, McVeigh chose not only the anniversary of Waco, but also the uh, execution date of one of the people in the Covenant of the Sword and the Arm of the Lord who is scheduled for execution that same day and who um, watched the coverage of the bombing laughing as he was put to death by the state. Okay. Um, so there's sort of a complicated social interface that shows us that McVeigh was not, I mean, what is it to act alone anyway, but he was not acting alone. The other piece of information we have is a strategy called leaderless resistance that right. was introduced by Beam in, well, popularized by Beam in 1983, 84, um, along with um, the early com computer networks. And the idea was that um, cells would be able to operate without direct communication from white power leadership. That strategy was designed to do two very important things. One was it was designed to foil undercover informants because the, the Klan and the civil rights era had become very, very frustrated by the presence of FBI undercover agents and informants all over the place in the movement. The second is that it was supposed to make it harder to prosecute white power violence in court because then, you know, if you take down one cell, you take down just these six people or these two people and not the whole movement. Um, but I think the larger legacy of leaderless resistance is that white power has managed to obscure itself as a social movement. Mm -hmm. And we're left with this series of um, disconnected actions where there should be a through line and a story. Right. Okay. So this one of the big reasons you think that we sometimes fail to appreciate the coherence of the movement is that uh, as a tactical matter, they have designed it to make it hard to see the coherence, to make it hard to see the connections among the groups that constitute it. Yes, exactly. And that's so that's what's happening um, in McVeigh's statement that he acted alone. I think he is embodying the strategy of leaderless resistance there. Mm -hmm. So um, as for his, his own connection to the, uh, to the war, in this case, the Persian Gulf War, uh, do you, I, I doubt we've covered like all of the respects in which you think there is a connection between um, war and and the white power movement and maybe extremist movements in general, I don't know. But um, do, do you want to say more just to make sure we understand 
the different ways you mean. I mean, one thing, the, the most obvious is people go to war, they become familiar with weapons, they come, they sometimes come back kind of messed up, right? That, that's one thing that happens. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are other connections you see, right? Yeah, I think the importance of the Vietnam War did several different things for this movement. First of all, it created, as we said, it created that story that brought people together across different belief systems. That was really important and that was made possible by the sure, they, they didn't. They sent us there, they didn't let us win it, they don't appreciate us when we come back. Yeah. That, 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 that kind of anti-government uh, story. Yeah, by contrast, um, Klansmen and neo-Nazis who had fought in World War II were not able to get in the same room um, un until the Vietnam War because there wasn't that sense of betrayal. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that the Vietnam War did was to provide a very material, um, what should I say, it, it provided the material and infrastructure for the kind of violence that would be carried out. And you see this in groups like the White Patriot Party in North Carolina, where they were actually obtaining stolen military weapons from Fort Bragg, which was the nearest army post, um, and training with actual stolen military weapons and material. That's literally using the technologies of the Vietnam War at home. Um, that's a very literal version of it, but we see that with uniforms, with symbols, with rhetoric, um, even with things like um, calling... Um, you know, using racial slurs for communist guerrillas in mm -hmm. Southern Africa that had been used for Vietnamese combatants in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also it's about this imaginary of the Vietnam War, this narrative frame of activism. The Vietnam War is what set the parameters for what people thought would be feasible and possible for how people could envision um, a response to what they saw as a militant super state in the eighties and the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that sometimes people come back from war kind of messed up. Um, and, and you, you, we've alluded to like, uh, I mean, other, there are various ways people can get messed up. Timothy McVeigh's mother left him when he was young and you know, who, who knows? There's another guy you mentioned, uh, David Lane, who you say was kind of famously sexually frustrated there's a lot of different ways that uh, that people can get messed up psychologically. Do you have a view on kind of what the connection is? I mean, people are sometimes reluctant to emphasize that theme because they think it, it'll be taken to absolve people of responsibility or it'll be taken to distract from what is, in fact, an ideological coherence uh, the, uh, uh, among the people who constitute the movement. I've never, I've never really thought there was a contradiction there. I mean, there can be an ideological coherent movement that draws disproportionately on messed up people, you know. But, but do you have a view on the on on the kinds of psychological forces that, in a generic sense, that draw these people into these movements? You know, I think it really varies a lot. I think, um, well, and I should say, only in a few places do I have enough archival depth on any person to even begin to see that kind of of information. I'm not a psychologist. I don't have sources that really let me go, um, that really let me go there. I have people who speak about their war experience um, in the language of PTSD, as we would understand it from that period. But whether that is done in a performative way or a genuine way is really difficult to say, because that was also a very popular way of sort of referencing um, your war experience in a way that would appeal to other people. Um, and when people speak about it, it's usually in the context of recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to say. On the other hand, I mean, there is there's some evidence that um, I believe Beam writes that he's diagnosed with PTSD. Um, he also, rumor is that he withdrew from the movement because of the effects of Agent Orange poisoning. So he's an example of kind of the embodied Vietnam War taking him out of the movement too. Of course, that would be a convenient narrative for people who stay in the movement, right? It's like, not only do we have an innocent explanation of why he deserted us, but we can blame Vietnam for this too. Uh, yeah, and I mean, like, I think that there, yeah, I mean, there's there's been some, some work by psychologists and ethnographers about what draws individuals to this kind of activism. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that there's actually a lot of different kinds of people in this movement. And that was one of the things that I found really surprising in the archive. Um, I found people with advanced degrees. I found physicists. I found rocket people. 
Um, there were, of course, sort of like, I think the stereotypical person you might imagine in a movement like this um, is sort of an uneducated felon. There are some uneducated felons who drop out of high school and join the movement um, directly out of prison. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of different kinds of people who wind up in this for different kinds of reasons. And some of them are trying to get out, right? Some of them turn state's witness, um, testify against fellow group members. Um, some of the women testify against their husbands. It's really interesting. There's all kinds of splits and breakages. So my, my take on that is probably, well, so as I'm speaking to you, I, I sound like a historian rather than a psychologist, which is there's a lot of sort of historical push and pull factors. Um, and I, I might not have enough to sort of generalize about state of mind. I will say this. I think that this movement tells us something bigger about the American mind in the 1990s, which is there's this moment at the end of the Cold War where the a lot of people had believed in imminent apocalypse and had, had feared the imminent end of the world. There's this moment when the wall, the Berlin Wall falls and the enemy disappears, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's this untethered story where people still believe in the end of the world, but the mechanism has vanished. The enemy is gone. And I think that there's this big moment of grasping around and sort of um, very deeply felt turmoil from people who aren't sure where the, where the danger is located. And I think for a lot of people that I look at, the danger is the state, but I don't think that that's true only on the right. And in fact, one thing that you find when you look at these materials is that there are ways that, um, you know, the radical right, as we think of it, um, is actually has more in common with the radical left by the end of the 1990s than it does with the center. So Lewis Beam ends up being um, a fan of the WTO protests in Seattle by 1999. Um, well, I mean, to him, the WTO is part of the New World Order, right? Exactly. Right. So for different reasons, but it's like an enemy. Of, so there's a, but a lot of anti-statism on both sides of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think actually brings those ends of the continuum together in some interesting ways across mm -hmm. the 90s. Well, maybe I shouldn't even ask this question, given the fact that you're understandably reluctant to speculate uh, about things that go beyond your uh, discipline of history, but I assume you've just, in a casual way, had occasion to reflect on parallels or, or lack thereof between these kinds of extremists and the Islamist extremists we hear so much about these days. You have, again, you have people drawn into a movement with violent aspirations. Mm -hmm. Some of them have certain kinds of histories. People speculate about what does it and and blah, blah, blah. And again, there's a, you know, there's a, a number of different um, kinds of, it's not, you know, different movements associated with it. And there's, you know, kind of degrees of connection that different institutions or, or may have and ways people get drawn in and so on. Are there, are there any, any uh, comparisons you've, you've, you've come to? Yeah. I mean, one thing that's interesting is just how, how acts of violence by each of those groups are reported. So we seem to have a predisposition um, in our journalistic coverage towards immediately personalizing and depoliticizing and disconnecting acts of white power violence. Hmm. Um, whereas there seems to be a larger, looser category called something like um, ISIS affiliated or ISIS style extremism. I see a lot of affiliated, which I assume means that people can't actually tie the actor to the group directly, but that mm. they, they're making some assumptions that often prove to be correct. I think that we might correct that division, possibly from both sides. I, so I you, mean, you mean with Islamist extremism, we are inclined to see it as this one big thing yeah. and connect to people to it fairly readily, yeah. whereas on the home front, it's like, well, that's militia, it's not really KKK, and, and that's skinhead, exactly. it's not neo-Nazi per se or whatever, but... Um, right. And not only that, but when we face an act of violence, the first impulse when it is white power violence is often to portray it as the act of a madman or the act of a lone actor, right? Like lone wolf violence comes from this movement. Um, 
Mm -hmm. like, but it often is part mm -hmm. of an ideologically driven, connected social movement. So I think that has ramifications mm -hmm. for how we think about reporting on it, how we think about juror education and prosecutorial strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has implications also for just very simply how we think about it, how we think about um, the history of, of these actions. Now, that's interesting because thinking about, uh, you know, modern Islamist extremist terrorism, or whatever you want to call it, when, when you look at an individual actor who's done something violent there and you start looking for individual causes, like um, you might say, well, he had been marginalized, he didn't feel at home, he wasn't fitting into America you tend to get a lot of blowback from people who say, are you absolving him from first one? No, it, it's this movement. It's the belief. It's yeah. this that he was subscribing to. Whereas, as, as I recall with Timothy McVeigh, the whole thing was, what made this crazy guy do this thing? I mean, I mean, what, where in his past can we find the thing that pushed him over the edge? Uh, and that is a different, that is a different explanatory approach. I may be exaggerating. I may be exaggerating the difference, but that's the kind of thing you're... I mean, I think you're right about that. It, I mean, one piece of evidence there is that, you know, they were looking for a Middle Eastern gunman or a bomber for the Oklahoma City bombing before they lucked into a arrest of McVeigh. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, in fact, yeah. uh, what year was... What year was... I wasn't... 95 was the bombing. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I remember people immediately inferring as it happens. I was at the New Republic at that point, And uh, I remember I won't mention names, but there yeah. were people who leapt to the conclusion um, that that was uh, Muslims. Had done it. Yeah. Well, there's all kinds of reasons. You know, there's all kinds of historical contextual reasons that people might think that coming right after the first World Trade Center bombing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Unabomber had not been arrested yet. I don't know. Um, uh, Unabomber was probably 95 itself. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But so before getting some familiarity with that, there wasn't really a model for this. So there's, yeah. I think, I mean, it's really interesting. The as a historian, it's really different. Interesting the way the different ways that our um, the history of the nation as a white supremacist place. Mm -hmm. still shapes us in a moment that we think of as no longer a white supremacist moment, more or less. Mm -hmm. I think that um, one of the things that this story shows is that a lot of people on the left and the right had this notion that we were living in a time when, you know, the American race problem had been solved. So conservatives, colorblind conservatism that, you know, did a lot of things that allowed a lot of people into the Republican Party who were Black and Latino who um, believed that that it was a colorblind party and took Reagan at his word, right? Um, meanwhile, on the left, there were ideas about the post-racial, there were ideas about multicultural America. And then in 2016, this all came sort of flooding back into the mainstream, right? I think that this book shows us where overt racism and racial violence went in that interim period. Um, and I think the history can really show us a lot about what we can learn from, from that moment. Okay. And I guess if we want to close on a, a positive note, um, you had said earlier that if you're wondering what did these guys plan to accomplish with so relatively few people having owning some guns and bombs, how did yeah. they plan to overthrow the government? The plan was that once they did some big dramatic uh, show of violence, all these white people would rally to their side and say, oh, you're right. We hadn't realized how oppressed we were. Yeah. Roughly the opposite happened after Oklahoma City, right? They were wrong. Yeah, somewhat. I, so what happens after Oklahoma City is on the one hand, there's a moment of public understanding and a series of um, government actions that kind of tamp things down, um, even as there's a surge in copycat violence. Um, on the other hand, what the movement did... What, was there much copycat violence? Was uh, just yeah, kind of small little scale? Ones. Little ones. No, no, no. Yeah. Very yeah, yeah. small. Okay. Ones. Small disorganized copycat actions. There's mm -hmm. an upsurge in activity, but, you know, small... From, I mean, people, from people already in the movement, presumably, who said, okay, this is our way, this is our... Yeah, so. I mean, I think you can think about the Olympics bombing as related in that way. Um, in Atlanta. But in any case, there's, there's a little spurt of copycat activity after mm -hmm. the bombing, but there is a whole bunch of sort of dissuading factor from from government crackdown and public backlash, right? But then after the trial, when there isn't a coherent narrative of what the bombing meant, right? 
we never got the narrative of this is what this was. Um, I think it just left open the space for this movement to regroup and reemerge, which it has done quite successfully um, several times before. Um, and I think that, you know, they, they were, as I mentioned, very adept at using the internet. So you see Stormfront, the first big website come up in right after the bombing. Um, and then of course, a proliferation of white power websites. Um, a lot of the movement relocated on online. Mm -hmm. And so all of this was rolling and active. And, you know, again, the fact that Dylan Roof was wearing that Rhodesia patch shows that there is a clear through line from mm -hmm. then to now. It didn't go away and resurface. It went underground and resurfaced. Um, so I think we have to think of this as a movement with many decades of organizing behind it, um, with coherent ideologies, even though they are reprehensible um, to me. Um, you know, they, they do have a worldview. They do have a, a, a series of goals and reasons for their actions. And they are things we can understand and, and, and learn from the past so that we can do better. Okay. And now I know you're reluctant to talk about the present because you haven't studied systematically. Your, your, your thesis is, as you just said, with this movement in particular, there tends to be more than, than meets the eye and there tends to be more in the way of uh, historical continuity. Yeah. That is evident. So, um, well, anyway, congratulations on the book, Bring the War Home. Thank you. White, the White Power Movement, Paramilitary America, uh, available everywhere. Um, uh, do you have any any uh, online stuff you want to do, uh, like have a Twitter feed you want to mention? Or? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's uh, at Kathleen underscore Ballou, or I have okay. a website, KathleenBalou.com, which is K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-B-E-L-E-W.com. Okay, great. Well, thank, thanks a lot for taking the time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.